Hello and welcome. Tonight we're speaking about natural capital and economics. With me is Dr. Mark Conte of Fordham University. Dr. Conte, thank you for coming. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Well, I thought we might start with the concept of natural capital. Perhaps you could talk, tell me about what that is. I'll give a brief definition. Natural capital, like other forms of capital, such as machinery used in production or human capital that provides innovation and labor to production, natural capital is both natural stock of resources, such as timber, and also flows of benefits that come from functioning ecosystems, such as nutrient uh, filtration by vegetations near rivers that keeps the water a certain quality so it's um, sufficiently high quality for consumption or other downstream uses. So it's both the stock and flow of different processes in ecosystems. And it can be organic or inorganic? Yeah, that's right. So it can be either, uh, typically we're thinking about biotic activity in the ecosystem, but we, we can think of natural resources such as fossil fuels, you know, uh, petroleum and, and coal and things like that, more as natural resources, resources as opposed to natural capital. This might be how we would we'd think about it because generally, I think natural resources were doing a pretty good job of incorporating in the markets and putting a price on and recognizing their value, whereas natural capital might be less, uh, less well captured, the value is less well captured in the market so far. Uh, I think it was E.F. Schumacher that, that first pointed out that you know, it's amazing that we have an economic system where uh, a large part of what goes into creating the goods and services is not accounted for. So uh, I think he was the first one to speak at length about the need to, to uh, the term itself, natural capital, and the need to account for it. There, there is a long history, going back to even, even Adam, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, realizing how important natural resources were for the growth of the economy. And then the neoclassical group of economists, it kind of fell out of our calculations. So macroeconomists started to think just about what we talked about as other inputs to production, labor and machinery, and left out the, the resources that had been the focus of, of work by David Ricardo and Malthus, who had talked about concerns about the growth of the population versus the growth of our agricultural productivity. So there's definitely has been a shift. The neoclassical paradigm, which really informs a lot of economics that goes on today, has kind of dropped out the importance of those natural resources. And so we see their value uh, is really, we take it for granted and don't place enough value on it. And that's led us to maybe inefficient use of the resources and why we're in this condition thinking about climate change and carbon and things of that nature. Of course. The obvious problem is that companies are allowed to externalize um, their costs and dump, dump uh, pollution into rivers and what have you. And so you don't have a true cost accounting of what goes into a product if, if you don't account for the degradation of the natural world that has uh, been part and parcel of that product's production. That's exactly right, and the efficiency of markets that economists is often, the idea that's often attributed to economists that we think markets are efficient is somewhat correct. There are conditions under which markets are efficient, and as you said, when there are external costs, when there are actions that take place in the uh, market whose costs aren't taken into account by the actors engaged in those actions, then we know that the market won't be efficient. And in those cases, economists favor government intervention. So some form of regulation can be imposed to account to write those externalities and internalize them. That's typically the preferred method when there's an externality between firms, a production uh, consumption externality, where firms' behavior affects the welfare of consumers. Now, you recently spent four years with a natural capital project. Do you want to talk about that? Perhaps you start with um, what was formed in 2006, and it was a coalition of Stanford University and the Nature Conservancy, uh, the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, one of the and the University of Minnesota. Yeah, yep. good. Play, good. Plays a, a major role. Yeah, oh, right. It, it came out of, I mean, the, the key individuals in putting together the Natural Capital Project were Gretchen Daly, who's uh, an ecologist at Stanford University, who's done a lot of work, very valuable work in ecology, but also very valuable work in thinking about ecosystem services, which is another 
piece of jargon that people may or may not have heard of that really refers to the benefits from the natural world that accrue to society. So some of them we might be familiar with, thinking about the salmon in Bristol Bay, Alaska that we're able to eat and the timber that comes from forests around the world. But other people, people might be less familiar with other types of services such as carbon sequestration and storage that occurs in lots of different vegetation, specifically in uh, the, the rainforests of the tropics and the boreal forests. Uh, and also nutrient retention by some vegetation near uh, waterways that collects some of the extra, the extraneous nutrient uh, fertilizer that's been applied by farmers in the region and prevents that from getting into the water and creating the hypoxic conditions that we've seen in the Gulf of Mexico. So that's kind of the term ecosystem services, which Gretchen Daly had really done a lot of work in that area. From the ecology side, Steve Pulaski is an economist at the University of Minnesota who's kind of one of the world's leaders in thinking about conservation and land use decisions. So he came from the University of Minnesota and knew Gretchen Daly professionally, and they were both involved with the Nature Conservancy, where they knew Peter Kariva quite well. He was the lead scientist there. And Taylor Ricketts, who was the lead scientist at the World Wildlife Fund, who had gotten his PhD from Stanford. So from these four individuals, and of course supporting people at each of these institutions, they've kind of uh, led to the foundation of the Natural Capital Project, which really tries to promote, provide information to decision makers, either at NGOs like the Nature Conservancy and the World Wildlife Fund, or government agencies and even third parties like the World Bank, who are making resource use decisions without necessarily having the full information to do, as you mentioned earlier, this accounting of the natural capital. So understanding the benefits and costs of placing a hydropower facility someplace or clearing the forest for agricultural production, the intention was to kind of, the tagline was aligning economic forces with conservation. So to understand what the implications of our actions were to make sure that we were using resources efficiently. And there's been a big, uh, addition recently to the group, I should say, from the University of Minnesota, John Foley uh, has come in to play a major role. He's done a lot of work thinking about land use and agricultural production around the world and how we can use inputs more sparingly in places where the conditions are right and kind of change input application to increase the yield, to close the yield gap between what the capacity of the land is and what we've actually seen. So that's kind of the, the leadership of the group, and the project has grown substantially. Now the, the managing director of the group is Mary Ruckelshaus, who has a background in marine biology and ecology, and ha had been at NOAA, a very successful career at NOAA for many years. Now she's leading the group, and we've expanded from an initial focus on terrestrial systems to thinking about marine ecosystems as well. So fisheries and the nearshore environment. So there, I don't know the exact count because, I, as you said, I moved to Fordham this fall, but there are dozens of people associated with the project making, making things happen. And the major contribution of the group is a software package that can be accessed. It's an open source software package called Invest. Invest. That's right. Um, and it's been applied all over the globe by members of the Natural Capital Project who have been approached for help in making decisions, but also has been used independently by different groups to help make these resource use decisions. So this software is out there, it's available? Yep, it, you can go to the Natural Capital Project website, naturalcapitalproject.org, and there's a whole description of how to download the toolbox. It's open source. It is, it is, yeah. So the idea is, of course, there are very, uh, there are very smart people working on the project, but there are very smart people all over the globe who are more familiar with local issues. So the idea was to build models that could function but that were flexible enough could be manipulated and updated to reflect current conditions to provide more valuable outputs. Well, Dr. Conte, do you want to talk about your work specifically for the Natural Capital Project? Sure, as an economist, one of the, the roles that I was playing was thinking about how to value these ecosystem services. And the relationship between economics and conservation has been a little contentious through the years. Um, oftentimes, non-economists think of economics as finance and business and less about you know the allocation of scarce resources and how to 
achieve efficient use of uh, those resources. One example I'll start with is thinking about efficient conservation and development of land. In the U.S., the Endangered Species Act, which was passed in 1973 unanimously in the Senate, uh, which today, you know, of course, would not happen, had the goal of providing habitat for species whose populations had reached low levels where extinction was a concern. And that act specifically forbade the use of economic arguments to prevent certain landowners from uh, being subject to the restrictions of the act. So they didn't want someone whose property was extremely valuable to say, oh, I purchased this with the intention of subdividing as a developer or building a beautiful mansion on the hills in Malibu, um, so I, I shouldn't be subject to the land. Let the person whose property is less valuable be subject. From that, we had kind of a situation where there were no incentives for compliance with the act. And in fact, it led to the, this phrase, the shoot, shovel, and shut up strategy. Mm. Because the regulators didn't have information about where the species were, if you were a landowner and found that the animal um, existed on your property, you had an incentive to dispose of it so you wouldn't be subject to those restrictions. And so now, in reflection of some of the, those perverse incentives that have been raised by the Act, we've seen a move to incorporate some of the mechanisms from economics that can be used to provide incentives for conservation. And that's something that I think the mindset that was somewhat behind the formation of the Natural Capital Project and the idea of assigning value to these things so that we could incorporate them in our economic system. And while there is, I mentioned earlier, there is a little controversy about putting a dollar value on things. Um, well, that's the deep ecology fear. You, I mean, the market is very efficient, but um, uh, capitalism is famous for its ability to commodify everything. And so, yes, there is a great potential upside for allowing corporations to, well, allowing the uh, governments and others to police corporations and you know, real cost accounting, bring those externalities into the cost accounting system. But, you know, is it going to lead to, well, what's going to happen to the commons? You know, is, is this going to increase the commons? Is it going to decrease the commons? Uh, is it going to lead to a situation we have now where if you have a million dollars to spend on a gold toilet, you can have it. If someone has no money for dinner, they have no dinner. Um, so will the people with the most money have the most access to our natural capital? I think uh, the most challenging aspect in terms of the ecosystem services, placing a value on them, certainly has to do with cultural services. And this can relate to um, you know, First Nations people, uh, which is how these uh, indigenous people are referred to in, in Canada, but it can also refer to the benefits of an experience of visit to the Grand Canyon and things like that. Assigning that value to those experiences, the, the feelings that you get from being in these places, is very difficult. And certainly, you could argue that any dollar value you put on it might be a lower bound and insufficient to represent the value. And so in that case, I think there is a concern that, on the other side, the benefits of converting to development for development purposes might trump the dollar value that you come up with there. So. I understand that concern uh, that maybe people with a lot of money get to do what they want if the market bears it. And yeah, that is, that's how markets work, so there is a problem there. But I will say that economists don't uniformly think that markets are efficient. There are certain conditions under which they are efficient. And for a lot of environmental goods, I think there is a need for some type of intervention, either from the government or from some type of communication between the parties affected to ensure that the resources are used efficiently. So I think there is a role for government intervention to ensure that even though wealth will drive outcomes, we can still achieve more desirable use of these resources. Do you have any idea how that sort of mechanism might work? Or could you elaborate on that? Well, sh sure. There are examples. I mean, you, you mentioned the commons, and I could talk about fisheries a little bit there, uh, but I think what I'll choose to talk about are uh, some mechanisms that we've seen for the provision of these ecosystem services where we have, and, and I'll refer to some of the water funds that have been developing around the globe, at, but came out of South America in Ecuador and Colombia. Um, in these situations, uh, 
water quality in the downstream urban wealthy areas is affected by behavior and actions and decisions of the upstream less well-off rural population. So you've got farmers and ranchers who are applying fertilizer or pesticides or allowing the cattle to uh, input nutrients into the system by not fencing off streams. And what that does is that affects the quality of the water for consumptive use downstream or for use in agricultural production downstream. And so here you have the wealthy people who want clean water, and you're right that they're going to get what they want, but the way they get it is by pooling their money together and providing compensation to the upstream rural uh, far population so that they are paying an amount that has to be greater than the willingness to accept of those farmers, right? That's how these market transactions work. And because you have greater wealth downstream, they are able to come up with sufficient funds to change this behavior so that you have better water quality in downstream areas while, in theory, and I think in practice from some of the existing water funds, you have higher quality of life upstream as well. What if it's the poor people that need water to drink and the ranchers are the rich people? Uh, you know, how would that play out? Well, so, so in that case, I mean, and, and water is not, not my specialty, but, but certainly in these cases where you've got these external costs, right? The ranchers are engaging in some behavior that impose a cost, which is the, the change in the water quality for the downstream population. One opportunity, this is the, you know, kind of a classic example from Ronald Coase, who talked about an opportunity to bargain between the people and use the use of property rights to define the outcome. And so you can achieve an efficient outcome where people are happy with the level of water quality, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be an equitable outcome, right, depending on who has the property rights. So in this case, you could have a bargaining which requires a well-defined property rights system and legal institutions, but you can also have government intervention, of course, and you could think about some system of taxation for excess nutrient runoff to kind of provide incentives for the ranchers to change their behavior, put up fencing around the water, the expo uh, above ground water bodies to prevent the degradation to happen. So I, I don't think I share entirely your skepticism of the mar market framework, um, but certainly it's not appropriate for, for every solution. We can't always rely on the market, so we do have to have some type of intervention under these conditions. So do you want to talk a bit more about what you're doing for Fordham now? Sure, I'm engaged in, you know, I'm, I'm still quite interested in uh, the provision of these environmental public goods. So I'm looking at a couple of different research projects. One I'll, I'll mention briefly that came out of my work with the Natural Capital Project. We were uh, approached by some of the governments in, on the island of Sumatra in Indonesia, which is home to many endemic charismatic species, so the Sumatran tiger, the orangutan, the elephant, the rhinoceros, and these governments of some of the provinces were thinking about how to design a conservation corridor that could help improve the population and maintain the long-term viability of the population for the tiger. And we were approached to say, what, ha what would happen, how would we change the spatial layout of this conservation area if we took into account some of these other ecosystem services? such as you might, your audience might be familiar with the impact that Indonesian deforestation has on carbon emissions released because there's a lot of carbon in the above ground biomass of the forest, but also some of these forests are in, are in peat soils, which stores even an order of magnitude more carbon per hectare than the, the forest itself. So when we convert that to oil palm production, we lose a lot of carbon. So if we thought about how we could use these conservation corridors to save some of those forests. Um, we use the tool Invest to provide different alternative spatial uh, configurations of the park. And from that work, I became very interested in this idea of forest conversion and how we could engage in more efficient use of the resource. There are basically two different types of deforestation forces or forest conversion forces in Indonesia, the large plantations, which are generally well-funded multinational corporations, and the rural uh, populations that are small holders engaged in sometimes subsistence, but also sometimes production for sale in markets. Uh, 
and this is an interesting topic when we think about the idea of um, where we're getting our food from. How, you know, we've got this population that's growing with increasing wealth, so there's more demand for more resource intensive production. And one of the things that's very popular is thinking about where do we locate our agricultural lands? And it seems that there's a big opportunity for an increased in efficiency if instead of deforesting kind of virgin forest uh, for agricultural production, if we just used currently degraded land, so lands that had been under production or were currently under production but just didn't have the capital to be reaching their potential yield, then maybe we could use, we could meet our caloric goals without uh, losing the forest. And so my research looked at the interplay, looks at the interplay between smallholders and plantations. And when you have this idea that maybe we should just have the plantations use the land that the smallholders are currently using, if there were markets for land, if the property rights were well defined, that would seem okay because the value of the land to the multinational uh, industrial agricultural producers is greater than it is to the smallholders, so they could pay the smallholders for their rights and use the land and the smallholders would be fairly compensated. Because property rights aren't well defined, when you shift the plantations from converting forest to plantations to using the degraded lands, essentially the smallholders get kicked off their land. And now, because they weren't fairly compensated, they're looking for some place to go and they go into the forest. So the potential efficiency gains that are available in theory actually aren't realized in practice because the legal institutions aren't in place to achieve those goals. So unfortunately, as with many of these stories about the environment these days, it's somewhat of a depressing or disappointing outcome. But that's, that's some of the research that I'm, I'm currently focusing on that I think is applicable to many other systems where you have the interplay between smallholder uh, populations and the well-capitalized corporations who are getting lease, leasing rights from governments. Interesting. And the Natural Capital Project, um, it's got, what, four years left in its mandate? It's a 10-year project, as I understand it. Um, yeah, I think it will continue going. I don't, I don't know so much about the time horizon, but they are doing still great work pushing the, the boundaries on developing these complex natural science models to describe the natural processes behind these ecosystem services, and then linking those to economic models that provide value for the services so that we can engage in prioritization of both resource use on terrestrial systems and resource use in marine systems. So I think it's an, it's an exciting time there. I And we're looking at kind of unanticipated partners uh, supporting this, this interest. We, when I was there, I had secured some funding from the Department of Defense, actually, to look at how ecosystem services uh, could be affected by on-base management on the different military installations throughout the U.S. And we partnered with three different military installation, installations uh, in the continental U.S., and we're looking at how they could meet the, you know, they're subject to the same restrictions as other landowners of the Endangered Species Act and other types of regulation, um, how they could meet those goals more efficiently, balancing the needs of training. And of course, one of the reasons the Department of Defense is interested in this, they were very strategic when they located their bases. They tried to have an installation, a base, in each of the different ecosystems represented in the U.S. because they wanted to be prepared to engage in uh, combat in all the different systems around the world. And so th one of the key ecosystem services for them is training. So they need to have these natural systems that are sufficiently robust to allow the troops to engage in the activities on the, on the landscape, but then to grow back and let the next rotation come through. So that's one of these partnerships that you, you might not have thought of initially, uh, but in the absence of, you know, kind of regulation to ensure that these services are being provided, we're seeing a lot of interesting private-public partnerships to engage in the provision of these goods and services. Very good. All right. Well, Dr. Mark Conte of Fordham University, thank you very much for coming here and speaking to us about natural capital. It was my pleasure. Thanks All a lot right. for your time. Very good. And thank you for watching. Good night.